Okay, well, welcome to the session. Wrapping up before moving on workforce transition and archives. Um, I'm JJ Compton, and I'm a PhD student at Swansea University in Wales, and you'll be getting a little background from me on workforce transitions. Uh, beside me is Ada Nandraru, who is from New Mexico History Museum. Then next to her is Amanda Fisher from Baylor University. And joining us virtually are Joe Luke from Union College and Max Krugholm from Oklahoma State University. Get those phones ready. We're about to have some QR codes. <laughs> You gotta hear my narration. Sorry, but okay. So here's all our dates. Can everybody see the QR code? So if you can scan that, it should take you to a link where you can answer the question. Have you experienced a job change in the last and then gives a number of years? And I'm going to and come over here so we can see our full load of results. Sorry, there's so much. I wish I could get rid of this. I don't know exactly what to do with this. So there's no votes yet. Can you go back to them? Can I go back to this one? The QR code. The QR code, yes, I can. Yes. That will be this QR code right here. Now a little technology, right? Can everybody see that QR code online? Are we good? Get it thumbs up. <laughs> I don't know if this many bars blocking if you were for that. They just switched the food. How about that? Everybody in here able to at least scan it? All right. Technology is wonderful. Isn't it? Online, you can scan it. I'm getting nods from, you know, I can see Joe and Max, so y'all are going to have to be my nodding people. Okay. So let's see if we've got some results on that yet. All right. We have some results. And this these will be active throughout the presentation. So I'll pull the charts in and save the results from the polls. Moving forward, um, we go to our next QR code. We have three of them. Sorry, from from click there. I yeah, love technology, right? As long as it works for you. There it is. My toolbar is yet again blocking. Okay, so there's the second QR code, and it is. Has the archive or institution you are employed at experienced a change in staffing in the last three years? <clears throat> so we were giving some responses on that. <laughs> <laughs> one person that says yes. yes. Let me go back to that QR code. Sorry, I'm moving too fast. But yeah. yeah. Just show me if I move too fast. And you can yell online by typing in the chat box. <laughs> We've got a couple more. Is everybody in here scanning? We're up to 18 votes. So here's kind of a, a look at 
still only letting me, it says 19, but apparently 100% of you all have had an uh, workforce change in the last three years. All right, and let's go for our last polling question, which is, if you answered yes, which everybody did to question two, what kind of staffing change was experienced? And you may select more than one answer on this particular poll. Uh, all right, and let's see what kind of data we get in this poll. We're seeing some retirements, some layoffs or job elimination. Ooh, a new position was created. Good for you. Um, some tenure tracks, some non-tenure tracks and staff, some managers, and then transferring to a different institution. So it looks like the only thing that hasn't happened via our wonderful audience is furloughs, um, which is good. So now we'll kind of go from the interactive part of the presentation into the non-interactive part of the presentation. So as I said before, uh, my name is JJ Compton and I'm a PhD student and this is kind of the work that I've been doing as a PhD student, which I will submit September 1st, hallelujah. Just gonna say that. Um, and this is kind of Oklahoma as a case study in workforce transitions. <laughs> Everybody can see online okay? I'm going to say yes. Um, this is a timely study. Generational shifts are in motion as archivists who entered the profession in the 70s and 80s are now retired or retiring. The effort to capture and understand the meanings of their experiences and contributions gains new resonance as the expertise that governs our guides changes hands. While my research predated COVID-19, and predated, I mean, I did 20 interviews and then the pandemic hit and I did five for my car, um, <laughs> it was made more urgent by it as the pandemic, which disproportionately seemed to affect older individuals. I'm put my hand here so my quote was. And as more people in the United States retire into their 60s and 70s, the project moved quickly so as not to lose the voices of a generation of retiring archivists to either health or locale. This is, to the best of my knowledge, the first state level examination of archival professionals that uses both survey data and oral histories. The research was done in a twofold methodology quantitative survey responses sent to library archive and museum organizations and qualitative interviews done with participants who are working or had retired or moved out of working within Oklahoma archives. These interviews are important because no group analysis of retiring employees of archives has ever been conducted, especially in the creation of a socio subculture like Oklahoma or any other state where political factors are a key element in revealing the archivist's contributions to the historical record. This is kind of a geographic distribution of where I had world history participants. My thesis draws upon the voices of retired, soon to retire, and ex-resident Oklahoma archivists, as well as the voices of younger workers of archives, libraries, and repositories, historical societies, tribal historians, and museums. As key oral historian Alessandro Portelli has argued, the value of oral history lies in its creative, dynamic, and communicative nature. The contrast of written sources is independent of the researcher's need and hypothesis. It is a stable text which we can only interpret. The content of oral sources, on the other hand, depends largely on what the interviewer puts into it in terms of questions, dialogue, and personal relationship. Of course, oral history is informed by the interviewer's personality, identity, and subjectivity. But as a practicing archivist within the state of Oklahoma, this project was shaped by, by a dynamic of a shared professional expertise, which allows an examination of one professional to another, a perspective that is sometimes missing 
when ethnographers and anthropologists examine as external professionals looking within a specific subset of individuals. A side-by-side -side comparison shows that the majority of respondents have been employed in archival institutions for 11 or more years, and that over half of those 11 or more years have been spent working within the state of Oklahoma at some type of archival repository. Again, this data correlates with the ages of the individual respondents in that those who would be considered mid-career or late-career employees are the same individuals who are retaining employment in the state. However, institutions are closing within the state. The Memorial Institute for the Prevention of Terrorism closed before COVID-19. It was at one time connected with the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial, but is now defunct. Along with that, the American Organ Institute on the campus of the University of Oklahoma closed at the end of the academic year 2020. Organizational culture and institutional memory are key to this research. For as Kenneth E. Foote reminds us, for archivists, the idea of archives as memory is more than a metaphor. The documents and artifacts they collect are important researches resources for extending the spatial and temporal range of human communication. This view implies that attitudes towards the past, as well as visions of the future, can sometimes condition collecting policy. Theorists must eventually come to terms with how archives as communicational resources are to be related to other means of memory conservation, and why some events are so well documented and stir so much interest while others lead such a small mark of a historical record to the point where archives become a memory of last resort. To conclude by summarizing, institutional memory and organizational culture were examined in relation to how respondents self-identify their place in the organization by identifying the nature and ranking of how they contribute to both. While the data collected was split evenly down the middle as to which was viewed as more important, culture or memory, it concluded archivists contribute heavily to both. <clears throat> Despite what current literature is revealing about the biases of archives, archives and archivists and their collecting practices and organizational structures, many respondents still identify as the institutional memory of their organization. Perhaps even as the lone arranger study, fearing the loss of that memory, or perhaps their own identity, as many are facing retirement or changing governing bodies. Thus, by taking oral histories of these respondents, a more holistic and yet still biased picture of the nature of each organization can be obtained, and the respect and memory that these career arch archivists have garnered can be preserved, even if the practice and policies continue to evolve over time as they should. How do we bridge gaps in the memory of any organization or institution amid the changing administrators, governing boards, and the evolving importance of an institution as viewed through the larger community's view? One early arch archivist wrote about the self-taught archives archivist of the early 20th century, generalizing that the archival professional had not been established and respected by society at large, but a minority of us believe that this respect and acceptance would come only with the passing of time by making ourselves and our work indispensable to others and by demonstrating our professional quality over a long period of time. Even so, today's archivists to have put in the passing of time for as many as 20 plus years still feel, steer, still fear the memory loss accompanying workflow transitions as those with or those who believe they are the institutional memory of their organization, retire, move on. The importance of allowing these self-identified persons to have a place in the historical record becomes even more imperative, especially within the state of Oklahoma. Here are some of the memories being made available through this project. Nicole Willard is a late career archivist from the University of Central Oklahoma. She talks about education. On the coast, there's really strong archival programs. They're entrenched. They've been around a long time. They're very well organized. Often their records are more accessible. We're in the Midwest. It's not quite as formalized. And then Michelle Place, who is now retired, 
worked with the Tulsa Historical Society uh, as the executive director and helped bring uh, the Greenland Rising site to fruition. She talks about being handed a box in the archives and was told, these are our archives from the 1921 race riot and you are to guard them with your life. These are the most important items in our collection and it did not take me any time. I mean, the blink of an eye to understand the magnitude of what was in that box and how it needed to be cared for. Mm -hmm. A Will Rogers quote that's still relevant today, what this country needs, including Oklahoma, is more working men and women and fewer politicians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so archivists are speaking out um, as to why this kind of work is important. Jeff Huff argues in the, Amer in the Society of American Archivists um, publication that archivists need to be a part of the world where archives are made. And we all know about the war in the Ukraine and how libraries and archives stepped up to that task. And one archivist said, Ukraine's archives are threatened with destruction and so many replies talk about how we should have digitized it at all. But no one funds archives and libraries with enough money or labor or digital storage to do that. So are we as archivists doing the work to preserve our history and legacy within our geographical regions throughout the many workforce transitions that occur in our areas? And that's the question that I want to leave you with going forward. <laughs> Uh, hello uh, everyone, uh, my name is Ada Negraru and I am currently the processing archivist uh, at the New Mexico History Museum in Santa Fe. Um, you have heard from my colleague, uh, JJ Compton, uh, on her research uh, dealing with uh, transitions in the workforce now um, in archives. Now, the remainder of the panel is going to talk about uh, case studies, uh, particularly examples from our own institutions or uh, in even our own situations. Um, as um, either ourselves or our institution have, uh, have gone through workforce transitions. So um, a little bit uh, about myself. Um, before uh, joining the new history, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the New Mexico History Museum in uh, January of 2023, just three months ago. Uh, I used to be the librarian um, and archivist, uh, one of the librarians and archivists at uh, the Devolier uh, Library, a special collections uh, library at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and I have been in that position for about uh, 13 years. Uh, and uh, in my case, um, I, I had to go through um, a family situation that required me to re relocate out of the state of Texas and into New Mexico. Um, it was in this case, a fortunate uh, situation as uh, I had quite a little bit of time to prepare for this transition. Uh, I found employment in my field and um, I could uh, entertain job offers and um, decide whether I would want or not to move on. Even so, uh, this situation created uh, 
quite a bit of disruption at my uh, former place of employment uh, for myself as the employee was moving on as well as uh, the current place where I work um, because uh, everybody who goes through this kind of um, a move um, is affected in one way or, or another, even in happy situations. So um, from the time when I put in my job application for my current job until I started on my first day uh, in Santa Fe, um, we are talking here about four and a half months. And um, during this time, I had to uh, deal at the same time with um, putting in applications, interviewing, finding the time to interview, accepting the job offer, receiving some rejections, not hearing from other places for a while. Uh, as well as performing the job that paid my salary at the level that I was expected to perform at. Uh, so, what did that mean? First of all, when uh, starting to entertain uh, that kind of a uh, road and adventure, because it was an adventure, um, you cannot keep this kind of news to yourself for too long. Uh, in my case, um, I uh, did inform my supervisor at the time that uh, I was looking for a new job. And so he was on board with this. The news did not come to him unexpectedly. Uh, and he was gracious enough to serve as one, one of my references. That might not be the case everywhere. There are cases where uh, people, uh, employees would like to pick up employment someplace else because of their supervisor and their situation that <laughs> the supervisor creates. And we all know that these cases exist. Maybe we not, do not know about all of them, but we do tend to have, uh, have this dance around the issue and not address it. Uh, in my case, like I said, this was a happy situation, yet, uh, I was aware that if I told one of my colleagues that, uh, or more of my colleagues, that I was going to move on, uh, the world would travel fast. So uh, I decided to tell my supervisor first when I applied. When I was interviewed and then when I was offered the position, so he was on board with that. I did that verbally at first and not officially in writing at first. And the reason for that was uh, that the moment he found out in writing that I was going to uh, start a new position, he uh, was obligated to inform the, the human resources department immediately. Um, I did not want that to happen immediately. I wanted to take some time to finish projects, to uh, keep working on uh, several commitments that uh, I was working on before a child would start bombarding me with all their requirements. So what I did want to find out first was how long the notice was going to be that we, uh, in my resources from me. We are usually uh, throwing around a two weeks notice phrase. That is not always the case. In my case, I found that found out that I needed to give a 30 day notice. And that meant 
um, that, uh, that I need to plan in such a way that uh, all my um, projects, everything, uh, HR needed to find out 30 minutes, uh, 30 days uh, before my last day in employment. Uh, usually, uh, that notice corresponds to uh, the payroll period. So if people are paid bi-weekly, they are required, in fact, to give a week's notice. If they are paid uh, monthly, then that would be a 30 day. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, as <clears throat> it happened that colleagues who gave only a two weeks notice lost some of the benefits that they uh, the HR should have paid them at the end of employment with my institution because they were expected to give a 30 day notice. So that's something to keep in mind. And then uh, I also uh, informed my references because it was, it's a good idea to thank the people who put in a good work for you. And it's good for them to know that probably no more phone calls are coming for me, for them to give uh, references for me. As well as uh, frequent patrons. In my case, I was uh, doing reference work for several um, long-term researchers, as well as a corporate um, company that had given us their historical records. And they were, were used to using me as their go-to person. And all of a sudden, I did not want them to find out that somebody else was going to be their go-to person overnight. They needed that preparation, let's say that. What did that mean? That, uh, that meant that uh, I needed to find out who the next go-to person would be. And that brings me to uh, the volume of the work that I, will, I was doing. Um, so I was, uh, like I said, uh, providing uh, reference. I was also uh, in charge with quite a few uh, uh, processing projects, as well as cataloging, um, collection management, and some outreach work. Uh, when I uh, decided to take a new position, that meant that my work was going to be done by somebody else or it was going to be split among my future, uh, my former co-workers. Meaning there was going to be fewer of them and more work for them to do. This is not news, of course. Uh, but I, I did have to approach them with my supervisor's uh, uh, approval and talk to them gently about them taking some of that work <clears throat> to the point that uh, all my uh, job duties were covered by somebody else because a job vacancy does not automatically mean that the job is going to be replaced overnight. So these, of course, are you know common sense remarks, but these are things that somebody needs to think about before they uh, they have to move on. And hitting the wrong arrows here. So uh, what I did was I planned, although we will see later on that the best plans don't always work out. Uh, and I knew that I had we were, uh, I, I had quite a short time to work with. Uh, 
uh, I collaborated with my uh, colleagues. Um, I was transparent about what I could finish and what I could not. Um, and uh, we always want to uh, finish our projects and have everything perfect in place for the next person who picks up. That is not always the case. So in that position, I realized that leaving things in a good place where, for example, uh, the processing collection, the collection of those processes uh, at the time uh, was half processed. There was an inventory going on and part of a finding gate, and there was nothing online yet. Well, when I gave that collection to my coworker who continued processing at that point, at least things needed to be clear for her. What is what in our box? Uh, if you don't have, you know, uh, labels, you can always use post its that kind of a situation. Be happy with that. I was not originally happy that I needed to do that. So that's something that people have to accept. And also, uh, saying no to new projects uh, and new responsibilities. We are still uh, thinking on the timeline when uh, not all of my colleagues knew that I was taking a new job. Meaning, when I was approached about picking up one committee position or another, or uh, another part of a project, I had to say no. This and uh, this clearly explaining why. That's hard to say no to new things. Although, what did I do? I came up with the idea of organizing this panel <laughs> and starting uh, a collaboration with my colleagues. And that also uh, did come up with new work for me. So that cannot always be the best idea. <laughs> um, and then, Realize that uh, you will have to go through all the forms. There are going to be paper forms or electronic ones, and you'll have to find out, like I did, whose responsibility is to submit them. That's not always clear. Uh, and out of all uh, these different agents, Usually the HR department is the least responsive. So I had to keep on, uh, up with them repeatedly, finding out what I need to do, um, what my leave accrual is, what my leave time payout is. Um, and then uh, I did a uh, uh, make an appointment with the different third part companies that manage the retirement accounts, uh, the health saving account, and so on. These are not always in the same place. Uh, and then there is the language that the HR uses. Uh, do not be shocked that after a decade or more with the same employer, you uh they will still use uh terms as in termination, separation, exit interview. This came to me as a little bit of a maybe shock that they use the word separation although or termination, although I was not actively terminated, I was just announcing that I uh, I was living on my own well. And then you also have to keep up with all the forms that your new employer needs. 
so you know planning is the best policy in this case uh, in my case uh, I also uh, had to plan an overseas trip um, and uh, to see family and that meant I used as much of my leave accrual as possible uh, one of uh, the reasons for that is that any unused leave accrual is lost uh, with the exception of maybe a few days that the employer pays you after you finish employment that Anything after that is lost, so it's best to uh, to use as much as possible. Um, and uh, also know that uh, the last day of employment is not necessarily your last day in office, and that brings us back to using your labor call. Um, there are also the electronic uh, accounts that we all use. Um, and that means, uh, of course, the, the employer email, uh, the SharePoint, Zoom, all those institutional uh, accounts that we all use. Um, in my case, um, I had to use SharePoint in order to upload uh, some documentation that uh, our team was using. Um, and uh, I assumed that they would stay online forever. <laughs> that was not the case. One week after I started my new job, I was contacted by my former colleagues asking, where did you put those PDFs? Where are they? And I said, in the SharePoint, I had given everybody uh, editing privileges, and uh, I assumed that, you know, that empowered them to use those uh, documents. That was not the case. Uh, the second I left, uh, those documents were removed from the SharePoint database because I was the owner technically of that account. Yes, they did recover those documents. What did that mean? No, the IT had to intervene. So it's better if those uh, measures are uh, made clear prior to deleting uh, you know, your account and uh, possibly transfer ownership to another of your colleagues. Uh, there are also uh, all the professional organizations that are all a part of individual subscriptions, listers, uh, and so on. All of my SSA, SAA, certified archivists, um, email subscriptions were through my former employer. I had to change all of that to my personal email because I did not have access to my new employer's email <coughs> yet. Uh, it did create quite a bit of uh, a snap with the SAA uh, account. I lost access to all of the uh, publications, that I thought I had access to. Uh, and why? Uh, because somehow I found out that I needed to inform their publisher or the third party company that manages their publications. So that's uh, another thing to think about changing your email in um, your profile does not necessarily mean that. Uh, an organization like SAA is going to change your access to all of the uh, of their all, all of their publications and so on. Um, and I believe that from now on, I will keep my personal email in my in the profile of all those institutions just to make things more simple. Um, 
And like I said, um, planning does not always work like we expect it to. Uh, so, yes, I was expecting that I was going to have to clean up my computer, my office, like everybody does. What I did not expect was that I would spend a lot of time talking, uh, sending thank you notes to everybody who was congratulating me that I would have, that I was living someplace else. Uh, I did not uh, expect that I would get a jury summons <laughs> in my case. <laughs> uh, scheduled for my last day at uh, my old work. How did I deal with that? I got a big problem. What did that mean later on? The second I landed in New Mexico because I was moving from out of state, I had to change my, uh, switch over my driver's license. And inform uh, the jury office in Texas that I was no longer a resident. Things like that can happen. Uh, inclement weather, check. Uh, that means the project that you are hoping to finish might have one less day for you to work on. Um, there are last minute questions from your coworkers, although you think you left everything in a good place. Um, and then of course the surprise, farewell party. All these things take time. We know they happen, but yet they seem kind of abstract and we don't realize how long they actually take until they do happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good idea to give your former uh, co-workers your new contact information. Uh, hence, I was contacted about the document snap room uh, by them. Uh, and it's okay to feel emotional when you leave. If those are your sentiments, now if you're extremely happy <laughs> to, to give a bad place, then that's an emotion as well. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, coming to, starting a new job, onboarding took longer than I expected. There was a lot of training. This was a different position than I used to have. And I was expecting new job duties. I did not expect that quite a few of the rules and the policy would be different at uh, a state um, archives institution versus uh, a private uh, college that I was coming from. <clears throat> so I had to be very patient regarding uh, learning uh, all the ropes in my new place, and I'm still new. There's there are yeah. three months. Yeah. And you also learn to deal with new. What did that mean? You mean Emily? So you deal with, with new personalities, with a new space, with new projects, workflows, and routine. Meaning, the new place had to prepare for my coming. This was a new position that they were adding. Uh, meaning. They had to find a desk and a laptop for a new person. And this happens a lot at places with fewer resources than, say, you know, academic institutions. Not that they have all the resources that they want, but still, at smaller places, the smaller the place, the harder it is to bring a new person on. Um, I had to learn where all the new shelves are, all the boxes, um, and to again have patience. I was eager to start in and start processing, but I didn't know what, where the collections were. I knew what, what they were, I didn't know where they were, and where they were being held, and how many basement spaces they had. 
this takes time. Be patient. And uh, kudos to my new colleagues uh, in New Mexico who welcome me. Uh, and I do appreciate that uh, this might not be the case of you, and so I feel lucky. And I also felt very lucky that the New Mexico archival community put me on their reserve the second I landed in, in Santa Fe. So while they're working on the that's it for me. Um, I am talking about the opposite perspective, which uh, in the survey, those of you who took part in that, all of you said that you'd experienced uh, a job in, in staffing at, at, where, at your place where you work. So um, I'm sure any of you could really get this presentation. So this is just kind of um, the experience that I've had, uh, sort of a case study in navigating institutional memory loss. So our, uh, at the collection where I work, our um, director is retiring at the end of next month. So we've had a few months to kind of figure out how to handle that. Um, so I work at a congressional collection library, uh, the Pope Legislative Library at Baylor University. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's on the left here. Um, and she is our director is retiring in May, um, next month. She was originally retiring next May in 2024. Uh, and so recently she uh decided to. To change that to this name. So we supported her decision, but it also means that um, a lot had to happen quickly. Uh, and I understand that sometimes job changes uh, in staffing happen much faster than what we were experiencing. But um, so she's worked here for, I think, at least 15 years. So that means that there is a lot of institutional memory that we're kind of afraid of <laughs> is, is going to be leaving very quickly. So um, you know, that kind of creates some anxiety, some uncertainty, um, but also there's opportunities for um, needed changes in the future. So, uh, you know, we're just trying to work through all of that. Um, and so we knew we needed to have a plan to um, to navigate all of that. So this is what we've learned so far, uh, and we still have some remaining challenges for it. So. Um, the first thing that we did was advocate for our needs. Uh, so, we, um, our current director is very supportive, and so she was willing to discuss with us what, what we felt like we needed after she left, um, and relay those concerns with our library team. Uh, and so our major request was that we would love to have a new director from outside who has congressional collection experience. Um, and then we would love, there are two of us, two archivists um, besides the director, and we'd love to have another archivist if possible. Um, and so we try to remain flexible if, if, you know, if that's necessary. Uh, and so uh, none of those are what we <laughs> ended up with. Um, <laughs> so at least not yet. Maybe there's still hope for another archivist to make this but, um So ultimately, uh, the library team decided to place us under the direction of uh, another repository. I keep this on, on the right there, um, the Texas collection, which is the Carroll Library. Uh, so we're across campus from each other. And so that means that we will no longer have a director in the building with us. So I'll talk more about that. But um, so that will take some adjusting. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, well, that's not really what we had hoped for. Um, there are a number of benefits to that. So one advantage is that this allows for a smooth transition in that we have been meeting with our current uh, student to retire director and the new director. Uh, and we can talk about all these things that um, our processes and workflows and everything that um, the new director needs to know. 
Uh, there are also historic ties between these two collections. So our collection actually originally came out of the Texas collection. Um, so now we're just sort of putting them back together. <laughs> um, we're not merging them, just we'll just report to the same person. But um, we're both focused on Texas history with different aspects. So I think you know there's there's pluses to that. Uh, one of our major outreach events each year, I think you call it an outreach event, um, is a summer civics camp for middle and high schoolers in the local area. Um, it's called I Engage, and we use archival materials from our collections to um, create these educational stations these kids go through uh, to learn about how to be a good citizen in their community. So it's a lot of historic, uh, you know, this is what happened in the community. And, um, so now we have access to materials. We always had access, but now we have staff and, uh, you know, to help run this uh, this event um, all together. So we can provide a more full picture of our local civic history. Um, so the first thing we did, which might seem obvious, is we began a list uh, of all the things that we felt like we needed to discuss before she left. Um, so we all shared our concerns with each other of things that we were afraid we wouldn't know how to handle after, <laughs> after she leaves, um, or things that we wanted for sure to have wrapped up before she left. Um, and so we began working on this pretty quickly because we only a few months. Um, so it included a few things like um, making sure, just like Ada just mentioned uh, earlier, making sure we all have access to files in our document sharing database. So we actually just learned that, you know, she makes us co-owners of files. That doesn't matter because as soon as she leaves, she was the owner. So those files will go away. So I'm glad we figured that out before and <laughs> then after. Um, also reviewing collection statuses. Uh, so there are certain collection materials that we have questions about, like, can you explain what this is? <laughs> um, so, you know, she's been there 15 years, so hopefully we're not the only archive that has some things like that that we don't know what they are. But, um, and also just updates on donor interactions with collections, um, you know, where is this collection in the process of being donated and how can we get to know these donors so that they, you know, aren't like, who, who are you? <laughs> um, and then also, you know, just things like building and maintenance updates. Um, our current director knows a lot of, a lot of people uh, that, that, you know, we don't have as much familiarity with, so we need to try to maintain maybe that level of knowledge and can be introduced and things like that. Um, these photos on the slide are from a book deaccessioning project she was working on. Um, so we have a lot of books that weren't related to our collecting scope. Really random, really random books. Um, so uh, sort of trying to narrow that down and focus on, on what story we're trying to tell um, related to congressional collections. Uh, but uh, my coworker and I were not involved at all in this project. And so if any of it got left behind for us to work on, we would not know the first thing about it. So just things like that. Um, so uh, there are some opportunities that we have discovered through this process of creating a list and talking about all these things, um, to, the opportunities to, to change things that we need to change. So uh, one example is our social media. Um, Currently, we were just, you know, two people supervising a lot of students trying to post um, a lot of uh, social media. And so we all decided that we would actually sunset our social media accounts um, and umbrella them under the Baylor Special Collection as a whole. So um, that might seem like kind of a sad thing to do, but um, it was taking up significant amounts of time for a staff of um, And that time could be better spent working on collections processing and supervising student assistants and um, other more successful forms of outreach on working with classes. We'll still have the opportunity to do one to two high quality posts um, with a broader readership um, rather than a whole bunch of 
quite a bit of other things with a limited readership and a lot of stress. So I think that would be a good thing. Um, another opportunity that we visited about um, and are planning to change is the number of student assistants that we hire. So um, we've always had hired a lot of student assistants just because we felt like we needed to keep our uh, reading room space open all the time um, and available for anyone to walk in. Um, and so we would use students to help us do processing, but also um, to have someone there all the time. Uh, and we really were starting to feel overwhelmed by having to, to do that all the time um, and creating processing projects for them to work on and checking on their work and um, also doing our own work. And so we noticed that staff members at other special collections on campus only had to monitor one or two students each and really telling me to make this happen. So um, in order to do that, we all agreed that we would move to a by women only um, way of handling the reading room and researchers. Um, and so for now, that will work because we have the number of researchers that that, that, that would work with. Um, they're not breaking down the door, so it'll be okay. Um, and so we created a new sign with, um, you know, okay, so you shut up and you don't have a research appointment. Uh, hopefully you would have figured that out before you got here, but um, here's what you need to do uh, to get in contact with someone if um, if you need some help. So it'll be um, hopefully more manageable. And also another benefit is we had so many students that um, some of them were having to do work in the stats area as opposed to in like the area where we all office. Um, and so now if we can have everyone just working in one space, we can have better control over our stats area. So that's kind of a positive. Um, so some of our main challenges uh, as we navigate through this, um, we're currently just hoping our to-do list will be accomplished. Um, and we have a lot still to wrap up. Um, we have finished off some of our uh, donor collection donation tasks. Um, we still have limited familiarity with patrons and donors, and so we're going to get some training on that. Um, and then for post SSA, we've scheduled a tour with our current director uh, to go through the stacks and look at some of these things um, that we don't know what they are. Um, <laughs> so again, hopefully, we're not the only ones who have that. Mm -hmm issue, but um, periodicals that may or probably not in the catalog. Um, we have some collections that have nothing to do with our collecting scope. Um, what do we do with those? Or, you know, <laughs> um, or carts with random stuff like a teddy bear. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, or we have art shelves with art that has little provenance. So, um, and then our Director is working hard to try to finish that book deep sessioning project. Um, and that also means that she has less time maybe to try to check off things on the list, but um, we really would like to get that done. So, uh, our new director, as I mentioned, does not have congressional collection experience. So um, that just means that we will all have to work to become more involved in you know, that section of SAA or, um, you know, with other archivists who who do that, so that we really feel like we know what we're what we're doing. So, um, and another challenge is so now we have this director uh, starting June first who will be the director of two libraries, so he's not officing in in our library. Um, so learning to be self sufficient, um, he just walked across all to talk to the director. Uh, and we won't have, you know, as easy to access to him. But also, I mean, there will just be a lot of trial and error the next year. So for this morning, um, uh, my coworker and I are, are here at SFA, uh, and our current director is out sick, and so that leaves no one. <laughs> so uh, just even this morning, trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to handle this in the future going forward? Can we both be out at the same time? Um, so I have a lot of respect for loan arrangers. And if you have any advice for us, that would be great. Um, but uh, in conclusion, um, just some takeaways that we've uh, found is um, go ahead and dream um, about 
what things could look like um, and brainstorm ideas. Um, and recognize that that may not all work out as you hope. Um, giving checklists um, and list of items to discuss with the, the new person. So it's not always the case that, you know, in our case where the new director we been able to meet before the old director retires. Uh, and use it as an opportunity to rethink how you do things. Um, and so it's still all a little bit TBD. We'll see how it turns out. So. All right. I'll be coming in here as the first of our virtual presenters. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up from JJ will do if so. Great. Okay. Thanks to the three of you who are on site so far. So my name is Joe Luke. I'm currently the Outreach and Reference Archivist at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Uh, last year this time, I was wrapping up as the Coordinator of Archival Processing at the University of Houston. And I'll be presenting today on reflection and relocation and role change. Um, a little bit of a roadmap. We're gonna go with the relocation and the role change, and then we're gonna double back to the reflection. I just thought that reflection sounded better at the front of the title than at the very end. So. Um, here we are on the left, we have the University of Houston in the Cougar Red. On the right, uh, we have Union College in the Union Garnet Red, which are not dramatically different colors, but they were more different than I expected them to be when I put this slide together. Um, so the University of Houston, probably very familiar to members of SSA. It's a short 1,768 mile drive up to Union College where I am presenting from right now, um, which is a city and a college probably very unfamiliar to people in SSA. Um, this was a transition from America's fourth largest city in the Gulf Coast um, to a small post-industrial city in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. Um, family, uh, just a little background, family was a primary motivation for the move, as it often is, but a return to a public services role was another focus of the move. So at the University of Houston, again, I was coordinator of archival processing. Um, I was conducting and supervising processing operations um, in a department of around 10 to 12, um, depending on the year. I was there for about four years. Um, I was the collections manager for Evergrowing Holdings. When I started there four years ago, I believe the collections were advertised as around 11,000 linear feet. Um, the job is reposted now at around 14,000 linear feet. So lots of collecting is being done by the wonderful people down at the University of Houston. Um, and it's all fantastic, interesting material that someone is going to get to process. Um, at Union College, I'm the outreach and reference archivist. So I am in public services. I handle instruction reference, outreach, exhibits, some processing, but obviously not being the head of the processing operations. Um, I'm in a department of three. We have defined roles, which is more like defined focuses, because in a department of three, there's a lot of all hands on deck mentality, like we saw in Amanda's situation. Um, the size of the college is dramatically different. University of Houston is a public university serving about 47,000 students. Union College is a private college serving around 2,000 undergraduate students. So um, up here, people always ask, how, how big or how much different is the size of the college? And I say 45,000 students different, which is always very dramatic. Union College was also founded um, in 1795. So our collection is not as big as what I was dealing with at UH. However, people have been collecting at the library here since 1795. Um, we have the first books that they ever purchased for the library and special collections that were very dramatically paddled up the Hudson River from Philadelphia in a boat that got frozen in for the winter. And so the bookseller had to camp out for a month waiting to get them up here. And lots of legacy metadata and description from hundreds of years ago. That was something that we did not have to deal with at UH. Um, so before I dive into the reflection piece, just a bit about moving the practical concerns. So uh, Ada touched on a lot of this, and I won't get into the details necessarily, but this is just to sort of establish what it feels like. And a lot of people in the field already know this and are very familiar with moving around because in archives, if you want to be an archivist, you often have to move across the country, maybe several times to have a permanent long-term position. Um, 
So again, I mentioned family. Our daughter was eight months old at the time of the move, which was a lot of fun. Um, advice ranged from drive at night, so they're asleep, so she's asleep, or no matter what happens, you have to keep moving, which was not a very good prognosis, but um, this is more or less what we followed. So um, the usual suspects stood in our path, again, many of which have been discussed so far. Um, finding housing, negotiating salary and setting up a financial life, the benefits, finding health care for the aforementioned baby. Um, pediatricians can be very hard to find if your baby is not exactly two days old when they let you in no matter what. Um, budgeting the move, packing while the baby sleeps or the baby is awake, the list goes on. Um, for so long that the job component often can take a backseat, and it probably should at some point. You have to take care of your life and figure out how on earth you're going to make this work. So at the end of the story, of course, we made it up here. We're settled in in one piece, and uh, we're happy to be moving out of winter, which is, again, feeling very new and interesting. Mm -hmm. So the idea of formal and intentional reflection came to me from two pieces during the flurry of the move. Um, number one was sort of the ongoing myth or ongoing theme in archives that a lot of an archivist's work is figuring out and untangling what the heck the archivists who were there before them did, um, <laughs> which is something that hopefully people are familiar with. It might just be me. I don't know. I've heard it a lot of times in my experience. Um, and also when I was applying up here, I was looking at Union College's mission statement, because that's what you do if you're going to give a job talk in a new place, um, which includes uh, the statement Union College education emphasizes integration, innovation, inclusion, and reflection for every student. And I thought that that was very interesting because I had not seen reflection included that explicitly in a mission statement before. Um, so it led me to think as I read about reflection models. What did I accomplish here over my four years as coordinator of archival processing? Um, how did it affect me? What do I wanna take from this and how can I use it in the future? So I found that there are countless models. So I chose the simplest, which is called the ERA model, um, experience, reflection, action. And this is what I use to frame my pseudo self-study that I'm presenting and discussing here today. Um, it feels and sounds very simple. It's three things that are very simple words, um, but the intentionality in these three steps can go a very long way, especially in a chaotic period of transition. So there are countless applications of reflective modeling across the archival enterprise, as I'm finding, um, from instruction session debriefs, what worked, what didn't, how can we do it differently next time? Boom, let's move on to iterative processing. How far could we go with this with what we had? Do we wanna process this further? This series needs more attention, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we'll focus this specific one here. Um, and again, as a case study of my own application of this. So experience, which is a big one in this case. So my experience in this sense was my entire four years of working a job. So I chose to approach this, um, my offboarding as the first stage in the reflective process as I was already going to be doing the roadmap and, off and offboarding. Don't worry about reading all of that. I don't know how well you can see it on the big screen. It's just there as an example of my debrief document from when I left. Um, so again, what have I done here? The work is never done in archives. Um, again, the work stays here, as we heard earlier on in the panel. Um, what am I leaving behind? Am I happy with it? What have we done? What did I do well? What did I not do well, et cetera. So this was also good motivation to build out thorough departure documentation, um, which again, takes time and focus that maybe you don't have at the time when you're prepping to move. Um, but it's important that you do to be able to hand things off to your colleagues. So again, here's the broad strokes of what I've done is the experience piece in this case. Here's the impact of that on the collections and services here. Here's where things stand upon my departure. Um, and again, this is likely a familiar document to people who have transitioned jobs in archives, which is a lot of you uh, given the polling earlier. So the reflection piece is the other side of the proverbial same coin. So we start with the same sentence to open it up. Here's the broad strokes of what I've done here. Um, but then we changed the focus over from the work to ourselves. Um, here's the impact of that work and the time that I spent here on me, both professionally and personally. And here's where I stand upon my point of departure, which was a pretty interesting exercise to go through. So I don't have a perfect metaphor for parsing out skills built, lessons learned, and feelings identified, but I've chosen a toolbox here at risk of crossing my metaphors because I had a suitcase on the first slide and a picture of <laughs> boxes on the second slide. Um, but toolbox it is, and bear with me, thank you. 
Um, so what this looked like for me, I, uh, I, as I wrote out my roadmap, here's all the projects that I've done. Here's where they are. Someone's going to need to do this. Someone's going to need to do that. Um, I was hoping to do this. I did not do this um, and so on and so forth. So the technical skills piece here, I was a processing manager. What did I do and what did I learn? How can I be intentional about identifying those skills ranging from knowing DAX to student hiring to professional onboarding, trading, offboarding, rehiring, training, oversight, et cetera, to research, to the day-to-day, -day, et cetera, et cetera, forever and ever. Um, the projects and time piece, what projects did I give my time to? How did that make me feel as a person and as a professional? Um, what did and didn't I accomplish and why? And what can I learn from that? Um, and what can I learn from that about the archives field and about myself? And then there's the interpersonal experience piece. So this ranges from working with colleagues in various roles through the department and library at the University of Houston to things like co-chairing an archives bazaar with my wife, um, which we both learned a lot about working together during, which was a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot about myself, both as a professional and as a person. So what do or did, in this case, I bring to those working relationships? Uh, what did I find myself wanting or needing or expecting in return? Um, do I want to work on this? What growth do I need to make in my new role? So again, these sections are different for everyone. They can emerge as you think or write in this reflection stage, or they might not, and that's okay too. So the action piece here um, essentially is very simple. It's mindfulness on these things as you join another team or undertake another job, um, enter another stream of work as it seems to be in archives. The work is always ongoing. So you're kind of jumping in with other people who are already on the move. Um, so I chose a construction site here as my little icon. Um, and all this can help your work as an archivist and perhaps more importantly, your well-being as a person who happens to work in archives. So again, reflection can happen at any place, stage, or time. Um, it can be after a conversation, or it can be after a project, or after a retirement, a whole career. Um, and you can use any model that works best for you. The bottom line is the intentionality to take the time uh, to think or write that reflection pays and to take those lessons forward. Um, the experience piece is already happening whether we reflect on it or not. We're all here at a conference doing professional development. We are already having the experience. Um, so a quick final note here and a plug for philosophies of librarianship, because that's becoming something I'm becoming uh, interested in sharing around. So reflection can be a great way to investigate, develop, and sustain professional principles and a sense of purpose across jobs, projects, um, vastly different roles in my case, vastly different institutions, and vastly different places. Um, and how your experiences and actions serve or don't serve those values in different jobs and situations. You can also build narrative for the application and interview process. Perhaps more importantly, you could say, I've done this across these different jobs and it's all served this purpose. Um, and also in review processes for academic jobs. It can also help with self-care and self-advocacy. I'm working on this and it's making me feel this way, or I'm not doing this and I want to be doing this. Um, self-care, self-advocacy to go, which are always things that we should be focusing on. So thank you very much. That's what I've got. And I will pass it on over to Max. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to share the screen now. There. Oops, no, that's it. I need to go to the uh, slideshow. Could everybody thumbs up? Yes, two thumbs up from JJ. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was going to present on, the, um, I'm going to focus on a newly created position is something that was referred by JJ in a, in a survey at the beginning. Um, no new, newly created position as tenure track faculty. Um, but I, I want to focus actually with this, and I'll tell you what I what my thought, kind of thought was uh, on documentation. Uh, so this um, newly created position as tenure track faculty happened five years ago when I moved to Oklahoma State University as a director of digital curation uh, in the university archives. 
and then prior to that, I was head of digital collections, um, non-tenure track assistant professor at Illinois State University. It's normal, Illinois. Um, so we'll see there. So for this present to put this presentation together, and this, there's more to it than that. I started to re I, I, for me it was important. I started to reflect on what I did before, and I'm going to focus on the past two academic positions, uh, and not just the now. With that, I think that um, wrapping up before moving on can be interpreted in two ways, and that it is not necessarily about someone leading a job; it's also about one coming in to a new job. In other words, um, we could ask ourselves what type of documentation we would want to get before starting a new position to be most efficient at getting started, um, as there is also the learning of different ways of doing things in different contexts. And I would like to, that said, I would like to emphasize on the, the documentation it's very likely that I may say something that you already know. Um, there are two different types. Of, there are different types of documentation. Uh, we look at the external, the end user, anything that be done for by developers, say, uh, just in time, and the internal, such as the process, project. But in the science, I'm referring here to the golden rule as the principle of treating others as one wants to be treated in a sense, in that um, it has been helpful for me to look back at previous jobs and uh, that I've had, and I could have documented my work better for someone else. Um, so I continue to improve the way I document my work. I, in no way perfect, but I, uh, I guess sometimes be complicated as seems to be the time uh, tends to always be the limiting factor. Nonetheless, as Meredith Farkas, uh, Farkas 2015 said, uh, it is easier to leave a project behind when you know there are people equipped and committed to support it, to supporting it, sorry. So in a nutshell, I think what's important for me and perhaps to several of you uh, about this is that to be a stickler for documentation. I think documentation is powerful, and this could be augmented by having a documentation strategy to provide a structure for the organization to help inform decisions. And I think it's worth noting that for good documentation, what I mean by this is data that needs that need to be relevant, not out of date, not duplicated, organized to be easily accessed using a consistent naming co protocol or convention. And I often bring this up with the person I supervise. Document, document, have you documented? Do you keep a documentation? So here are some examples. Uh, I'd like to detail you know, a little more detail about this before getting into emphasizing on the drives and accounts, uh, a bit like what Ada was talking about. So I think, um, Documenting the, who the contributors are, it could help somebody uh, who's, who comes in to really to help you know, getting more the better lay of the land in a new context and pro any projects that need that are unfinished or need to need maintenance. Uh, that could be in and outside the library as well as outside the, the university. Associated with that is a workflow. It could be a digital project lifecycle, uh, any processes that were used, uh, anything helpful, uh, leave it to the, to the person who replaces you, but also uh, it could also be good to find in a new position. Uh, any grant project, and is anything to uh, list any lesson learned from that? And any associated uh, uh, logistics, um, so who were the partners in that and IT and uh, what IT contributed to um, um, I think a big one here is also the deed of gift, informed consent. 
And that could not just in the work, but it could also be in committees. Um, why did we have the, actually the right to put this online? Um, and then, of course, for that, so they could maybe simplify our task to, do, to look for any copyright, sta copyright statement for uh, collections to put, put online, uh, photographs to be disseminated, uh, recordings, video, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've had a project back in the day uh, where uh, I was guaranteed that there were uh, copyrights checked. It turned out as I was about to... Pro to it turned out that I need to get involved with um, legal counsel and then practice due diligence to gather uh, the remaining of the, um, of the rights until looking at other situations, other solutions to still make them online with some restrictions. Uh, Guidelines, protocols, user manuals, uh, and I think about guidelines, the file naming, that's something that I find important. And then documentation, I guess, readme file is definitely a good one. It could include what, where, when, who, how, and why. Um, anything that could help the next person or could help you. Uh, data. And uh, coding, coding. Um, I'm working currently with a graduate assistant who codes, uh, and uh, the co documenting the coding is, a, is another important one. Uh, in terms of the data, um, I'm so the data it could be distributed in shared drives at your own, at your organization. But it can also be disseminated and shared in drives such as Google Drive or, or OneDrive. Um, I think with that, um, there's a bit of, it's, I think it's easy to use Google Drive, uh, working on pro projects online, communicating via Zoom or Teams. Uh, the thing is what happens to the documented to the documents on Google Drive, if you leave, if what, leaving, um, I've had the conversation with folks uh, saying that using OneDrive, they were quite adamant of using OneDrive because it would stay at the institution. And in fact, some universities do limit the use of Google accounts. Uh, it still does it exclude that people will use Google Drive. I use Google Drive myself and so it's it really adds to um, you no, know, it creates an additional a complex an additional layer uh, to be in, to ensure that things are documented adequately, and then increase the likelihood to uh, the documentation will be kept should we be using uh, OneDrive, I suppose. So I think with all this, with it's easy to take for granted, I suppose. But in terms of account here, um, uh, the, for example, setting up accounts of Google Analytics for Content DM, um, I remember setting up an account on Google Analytics using a Google account of mine. Uh, it was documented with IT, uh, but um, I guess things would be fell between the cracks. So anyway, um, I was contacted uh, to be able to reset the Google account and the analytics. Um, so it, everything worked out, but it took additional steps um, for the person first to find me. Um, and um, so along with that, I guess, um, adding collaborators, I think it could be another way to um, perhaps help minimize the risk of losing information. So I think with this, that's really all I have. Uh, ex one thing I'd like to say in, to add to this, uh, I'm thinking I was talking about a digital world here, but uh, there's also not to exclude the paper world. What happens to those boxes of paper and uh, what happened to them when uh, people or offices are moved and you come to a new position and uh, you you have to, then where are they? If this, that's another part of the documentation, I think. 
Um, so with that in mind, uh, I think I'm closing uh, the, um, the presentations here. So JJ? I'm here. Stop sharing. I think that concludes all five of our presentations. We've left some time for Q&A. And just as a side note, um, I'm currently the interim director of the library where I am. Unexpectedly, after both our dean and interim dean both left in the last nine months. So talk about workforce transitions in theory and then also in practice. I think we're all, all right there. Um, if you have any questions for any of us, we'd be happy to try and feel the, the best we can. Yeah. Oh, there's a three on that. I'm going to click on that. I have kind of a comment. The, um, I, I don't know if any of you remember Tom Clarison. He used to be a member of this organization. He worked for Amigos. But now he's at Lyricist. I've been in touch with him. And he's lately been doing uh, workshops on kind of on this topic on transitions and continuity in, uh, in archives. And he says it has been surprisingly popular. They're all sold out. So evidently, this is a hot topic. So. I guess so many, so many of us are retired <laughs> soon. <laughs> Nobody has any date. I guess we'll conclude slightly early, maybe five minutes early. <laughs>